Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Trophy and it's a babbling Belgian and welcome back to Gwent Edge, the show where we talk about new things in Gwent because uh, yesterday patch 8.5 has been released. It's been a very rocky road again. The game uh, basically didn't work for most of the day, but uh, right now we're past all that and the game is in perfect shape again. So today in this video we're going to go through some of the changes in patch 8.5 and then we're also going to go through the new journey because Triss's journey has arrived. Of course the obvious uh, choice after Yennefer's journey last time we're going to go into Triss's backstory right now. But first let's go into the deck builder, let's go into the cards and everything that has changed because even though we didn't get new cards we did get a lot of balance changes and I wanted to talk about a few of them. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is more of a general note. I do like what they've done with um, well kind of like certain special cards and turning them into location cards. So there's three that actually received a change. Uh, Land of a Thousand Fables has changed from a special card to a location that location of course also has resilience as always so right now land of the thousand fables just does the same thing on deploy you play a special card from your deck but on order you transform a special card in your hand into a random unit of the same provision cost from the same faction i've checked this already and if you transform a special card in your hand that doesn't have a relevant unit with the same cost then nothing happens uh, you do waste your order ability but it's not like that card then disappears um that's the first location that has been created Svalblood totem has changed from an artifact to a location as well so the only change here is that it now has resilience so you could spawn the Svalblood fanatics on one turn and then activate the order ability on the next turn which is something that you most likely don't want to do because those uh, two bits of uh, two damage are of course used to turn the fanatics into those uh, beasts but uh, yeah still it gives you the option if you want to and then the final one that has changed is army i think the ability is basically the same so six boost and three armor but it's been split up between a deploy and an order ability so especially for dwarves you could split up the boost and the armor if you want to give one unit the boost but another unit the armor which is definitely an option also has resilience so could you, you could use that in the next turn what's important to note about this however is that since those cards are now locations they're gonna take space on the board so that's something to keep in mind if you're playing a swarm unit deck um, but I think in most cases for these cards that's not gonna make too much of a difference so then there's one card that actually got a nice provision buff although I think I think it is yeah so the operator got a provision buff from 8 to 7 which is good because now we have a neutral card that can spawn a copy of a bronze unit card for basically around the same cost as you would uh, with Karantir if you compare it. Because for, of course with Karantir you make a one power copy of something of yourself but you can include gold and your opponent gets nothing. With Operator you summon a base copy of a bronze unit from your hand to this row and to your other, uh, well to the other player's side as well. So your opponent gets something out of this as well. But uh, still, this is going to be very, very cool to include in a lot of decks. And I've already included it in one deck that will be coming to the channel rather soon. So that's it for neutrals. Let's go over a few of the changes in the monster cards. Not that there have been all that many. Um, there's a few buffs to the leader cards. So Unseen Elder, I think, got a power boost from 5 to 6. Then same with Eredin, also from 5 to 6. And then I think uh, Deathlaugh, yeah, this one got its base blood moon uh, duration increased by one so from one to two turns and then of course can up to go up to four for every adjacent vampire so still a very powerful card and even better now but the biggest changes actually came to the stratagem so urn of shadows now triggered that wish of an allied unit so no bronze restriction anymore so you can trigger um gold units that wish abilities most of them actually have a well, not that handy that wish ability, but something like Plague Maiden, for example, is immediately seven points. You have those rats, and then you could put uh, something like uh, Glusty Warp right onto that and get all the rats. So this is actually very, very powerful uh, if you play this correctly. But yeah, I mean, Deathlift High Vampire Ruin, that will all not trigger properly if you just trigger it, aside from it dying. But uh, Miruna could be triggered. 
Um, but there's a few others that you could definitely trigger, like the Manticore. Um, so definitely a lot of options now for the Urn of Shadows, making it a very powerful strategy card in a monster deck. But then the biggest changes actually are located in the lower tier levels. Because if we go into Arcaspore, this has changed from 2 power to 4 and its ability has been removed completely because it got the ability of the Foglet. So on that wish, you summon all copies of this unit from your deck to this row. So basically the same ability of the old Foglet. But now Foglet actually got its even older ability back. So Foglet now does on that wish you spawn Fog on the opposite row for three turns, meaning that you get six damage out of that. I mean, up to six damage, of course, if there are no units or the units are armored, Fog will not do anything. But still, very, very cool that Foglet now actually returns to Fog if it dies. And of course, there are two Foglets in the uh, archetype. So we also have Ancient Foglet, which has also changed. He now has four uh, power to start, six provisions though, has Veil, and on deploy you boost yourself by the total duration of row effects on the opposite side. And whenever you apply a row effect, you boost yourself by its duration as well. So basically, a seditious aristocrat that instead of triggering on spying units, it triggers on weather effects. Which is really, really cool. Um, I think I might actually make a monster weather deck with this. Because it sounds like it has just enough support now to make this work. But that's basically it for the monster changes. Of course, there were another, a few other uh, provision buffs. But uh, I'm not going to go into all of that too deeply. Now for Skellige, that's something else. For Skellige, the stratagem also got a boost. So now you get two crows instead of one after you use the Mask of Ouroboros. But uh, there's a few other changes that have been made. Aest, for example, has his Bloodthirst increased from 2 to 3, so making it a bit harder to get the deploy ability going. Um, but there has been a leader ability change in Skellige as well. I'm just quickly going to show you this. Reckless Flurry, now instead of, I think it was 8 damage that was split randomly originally, it now has turned into an order ability that has three charges and every single time you do three damage randomly between all enemy units, still ignoring armor. Meaning that it has been increased by one and you have a lot more flexibility of when you're going to be using this. Because you could save it all up for one single round or you can use a charge to generate some bloodthirst on your opponent's side of the field. So Reckless Flurry is a lot better than it was. So very, very useful indeed. Then we got a buff to Krach on Crate as well. So aside from his original ability, so the two armor to three pirates or ships in your hands, we've seen that in the pirate deck guide. And of course, whenever you play a pirate or ship next to Krach, you damage it and the lowest power enemy by its each other's powers. That still is in effect as well, but he gained his onslaught order ability. So basically the leader ability uh, you have with onslaught is now on Krach as well. So you can damage a unit by one every two turns. Uh, which is cool. It's it's a, a, a very good buff to this card, but usually this card gets destroyed before it can do anything, so giving it an order ability without zeal is not going to change much, to my opinion. Of course, unless you can protect it, but you still need to protect it. Then another card that got her original ability back is Coral. So, zeal, still the same. Order, still the same. Discard a card and draw a card. But whenever you discard a card, you damage a random enemy unit by two. This used to be only valid for if you discard special cards, but now it can work on any card. So you could toss away the skirmishers, get them on the board for four points, and then get another two extra damage on the board as well because of Coral. So Coral got actually a very significant buff just by a very slight description change, which is very, very nice indeed. And that's basically it, aside from a few smaller uh, provision buffs and changes for Skellige. So yeah, some very precise, nice changes that can buff some of the uh, lesser used archetypes like pirates and discarding. Then Northern Realms. I think Northern Realms got almost the most changes in this patch, which is nice, I guess. Um, there's a leader ability change. So I'm actually gonna show you that first. If you go to Pincer Maneuver, Pincer Maneuver has changed because it rarely was used before. But now you actually have two charges of the ability allowing you to draw a Northern Realms card of your choice and then shuffle a card from your hand back into your deck. So you can basically do this twice, giving you two options to grab any card you want 
from your deck and put it into your hand. Extremely powerful because this gives you the consistency that you need. Every time you do this, you also spawn a two power volunteer on your melee bro. Now, the downside to this ability is still the same. If you have all the cards that you need, then this leader ability is basically useless because you won't be getting any fancy cards anymore. And the ability that it boosts the card that you grab by five is also completely gone. So the cards that you draw just stay at their original power. So I'm not exactly sure if this is what Pincer Maneuver needed, but I guess we'll see uh, real soon if that's gonna change. There's a few things you can do, especially with something like the Arch Griffin, because you could boost it, get it back into your deck automatically at the, at the end of the rounds, and then get it back into your hand with your leader ability guaranteed, which is nice to say the least, but this could still be pulled with um, like Oneiromancy or even Amphibious Assault because it's 9 provisions. So, I don't know. I feel like the leader ability is still a bit weak compared to the other ones. Now, my buff Commandos deck actually got a very significant boost as well. Because King Foltus changed to, well, from 7 to 6 power. He dropped 1 point of provisions. But... He also has a passive ability now, well, another passive ability, that at the end of your turn you boost the unit to the right by one. So basically the drummer ability comes on full test himself. So meaning that the only thing you need to do for, to have a very consistent commando stack now is instead of putting a drummer and then a commando or a commando and then a drummer so it gets boosted at the end of the turn, you only need to have a commando on the field, which is definitely something you'll have. And then you put full test right next to it and it will automatically generate more commandos without the need for an extra drummer. It is more vulnerable now, vulnerable now at 6 power. But that can be um, well negated with something like Radovitz Royal Guards. Giving it a few extra points of uh, power and a bit of armor. Um, so yeah, full test. Very, very powerful card now. Um, which is something that we can't really say about Meave. Um, Meave is... I mean, Meave... His ability on paper is very powerful, but it takes too long to trigger. So originally when I did the leader card review, I thought this counter was lowered automatically. And if you were inspired, it lowered the counter twice. That is completely wrong because I tried that out and that's not how this works. So it only reduces the counter by one if you are inspired. So that means that it takes at least three turns for this ability to trigger. If your opponent can lock it or remove it in any other way or get it down enough so that it's not, no longer boosted, this card is useless. Even though it did get an extra passive now. So, um, well, actually two extra passives. So right now when the counter reaches zero, you also reset the counter. So technically you could have this happen twice or even three times if you start with Meave, but that's going to be very, very risky. And it, uh, yeah, Meave is probably not going to survive that. But whenever this unit receives a boost, you also gain one armor. So you're going to be wanting to boost this card immediately. So if you put it to 8 power, it also has 3 armor in one go. So pure damage is going to be really hard to take that out. But you don't need to take it out. You just need to damage it, basically. Uh, and then you also have locks. You have, um, yeah, Koralti Heatwave. So... I still don't see the use for this card, uh, even though it is pretty good on paper, but in practice it usually gets destroyed or locked before you can actually do something with it. And then the one card that I wanted to talk about in the lower provision range is the PFI, the poor freaking infantry, because it's returned in its original form. So right now it starts at 3 power and you spawn the left fucking flank and the right fucking flank on both sides of this unit. So you get uh, two 1 power units on, um, well, a one power unit on the left and a one power unit on the right. So giving you five points for four provisions. But this basically also gives you a quick way to generate extra units uh, on a low provision card. Which is something that Northern Realms is starting to pivot towards. Especially with Queen Meave's ability even though it's hard to trigger that. But still you have a lot of units on the board. And that is going to be really really handy if you want to go to the swarming archetype in Northern Realms. And that's it for Northern Realms, basically. Um, again, a lot of provision buffs, um, but that were the most important changes. Then we can go to Squiatel, because Squiatel also got a few uh, minor uh, increases in power. Not the least of which is, of course, a buff to Invigorate. So the leader ability that nobody uses. Invigorate has changed from uh, a single order ability that used to just boost all units in your hand by one. 
to a two charge order ability, which allows you to boost five select units in your hand by one. So giving you better control and giving you the same uh, point ceiling, so 10 points. But of course you can double boost cards like Aglaïs and Sheldon Skaggs to double up on those points again. Because of course Sheldon Skaggs gives you the boost that he has on deploy in damage as well. And Aglaïs doubles the boost that she has at the end of your turn which is a very powerful finisher, especially if you can guarantee two extra points on that. So that guarantees, I think, if I go back just a little bit, that guarantees that Aglaïs will go... Yeah, she starts at four, so definitely eight, but of course you will be boosting her even more. And Sheldon Skaggs will do two damage, so that's ten points on an eight provision card, guaranteed if you uh, have them in your hand and you play the leader ability. And then the only other change that I really want to talk about is a Squirtel Neophyte. So still two power and spawns a base copy of himself on the other row. So giving you four points, but he gains an order ability. And I'm guessing it's a base copy of it that both of the copies have this order ability. And you can transform an allied elf into an elven dead eye. So basically you play the Squirtel Neophyte. You use him in the next turn to transform like, for example, uh, Hattori. Um, which is a two power elf into a delven dead eye giving you another dead eye for your nova null cl and um yeah just your elven swarm in general um and then you can use the the other neophytes ability because the copy of it to transform the original neophyte also into a three power elven dead eye so giving you the almost classic by now six points for four provisions which is very cool because it also just gels very well with the Elven Deadeye archetype. I feel like it might actually make it too powerful because this also uh, works on, of course, the stratagem, which is still the same. You spawn and play a Squirtail Neophyte, but it's called an indirect buff because of the uh, Neophyte buff, which is, yeah, I'm go we're going to see even more uh, Deadeyes because, of course, Vinyl CL just kills the entire board. There are that many Deadeyes on the field. And then we have Nilfgaard. Nilfgaard got its... Well, I would say almost inevitable uh, debuff. Um, well, I call it the debuff. It's a nerf to a Masquerade Ball. So I talked about this in the previous deck guide already. But Masquerade Ball has been nerfed very ever so slightly. So right now the scenario only progresses when you play an Aristocrat on your side of the field. Meaning that it does no longer trigger on Roderick. And it does no longer trigger on Joachim de Wet. So these two spying aristocrats will no longer trigger a Masquerade Ball, which means that you have no way of triggering Masquerade Ball twice in the same turn anymore. At least not that I can think of. So it is making you a bit more vulnerable. Still, if you work with aristocrats, this card will basically remain the same, but it gives your opponent an extra turn to uh, get rid of it, even though I feel like the, the nerf is a bit overblown. You have less cards to trigger it, but you can circumvent that with some smart deck building and it's still a very powerful card with a double poison if you need to. Um, the other card that got a buff basically is Emir. So Emir didn't change provision wise, he didn't change power wise, but you get the seizing of one power enemy units with spying is now an order ability, which is good. Because I felt like if I played this card, um, the annoying thing was that he was removing spying cards from our opponent's field and a lot of other cards in Nilfgaard tend to benefit from the fact that there are a lot of spying cards on the other side of the field. If you seize them then you just reduce your own um, benefit basically. You do get two points every time you seize one but it's better that you now have the control over it because it is an order ability but you actually get it back every time at the end of the turn. So if you have Devotion, that uh, order ability is refreshed at the end of your turn, so you get it back if you've used it, which is very nice. So still giving you the two points every turn if you want to, but it gives you the control over it completely. Then the other small change to Nilfgaard was to one of its leader abilities, the Imperial Formation leader ability. So still boost an allied unit by two, three charges, and once all charges are used up, you move a soldier from your deck to the top of it. But right now as well, you also get extra armor whenever you play a soldier based on the amount of adjacent soldiers. So if you play a soldier right next to one soldier, you get one armor. If you put it right cuddly between two other soldiers, you get two armor, which is really, really, really good. Because that basically allows you to protect any of the, uh, what used to be very fragile uh, soldiers. 
such as the Impera Enforcers and of course the Artfane Crossbowmen. Um, all of them will gain extra armor, especially for the crossbowmen, that's very beneficial because of course as long as they're uh, armored up, they will damage a random enemy by one whenever you play a soldier. So definitely very good support for the soldier archetype in Nilfgaard, which is, yeah, I'm, I'm totally here for that. And then I think the faction that got the most changes, um, both buffs and nerfs. So let's start with a few of the nerfs, because Cleaver lost his armor. So meaning that Cleaver, even with um, his starting ability, if you don't put him right next to a crown sputter, he will start at 5 power, which is usually how he's played right now. You just play him naked. Um, but usually that gave him 5 power and 2 armor. Right now that will only give him 5 power, making him very easy to remove with 5 power damage cards which is what this game is full of. It is going to make this card a lot weaker, but remember you still get the fee ability, so you will be spending a lot of coins to give him some extra protection. But yeah, I will. I think we'll, we'll see Cleaver getting destroyed a lot more right now. Uh, Horson Jr. got a bit of a buff, because if you have Devotion, you don't need to damage a boosted enemy by 6 anymore. You can just damage any unit by 6. The rest remain the same of his abilities. Um, I think Grand Inquisitor Helvete also got a power buff, so from 5 to 6, so that is a very minor one. So in the lower provision ranges, we got a few changes as well. I actually don't have any clue what this card used to do. I've never seen it played. But right now it actually gives you a bit more um, of a buff towards the Poison Archetype. So the um, Salamander Alliance deck that I created is going to be even more powerful if you use this card as well. Because this gives you an order ability that allows you to poison an allied unit and boost it by 2. So basically giving you 6 points for 4, but you poison that unit. Which is definitely an option. Uh, it's going to be pretty good if you've... Uh, play this card but I feel like the Fistech Trafficker is better because it gives you three coins which is more flexible to use and you can poison your opponent's unit as well if you don't want the extra coins so I think it's a bit of a weird change I think this card is basically still superfluous because the um, the Fistech Trafficker is just better uh, gives you more options and gives you the same amount of uh, yeah, points if you uh, even more because coins are definitely more uh, worth more than points these days um, so yeah, Fistech Traffic is always going to be better. Then probably one of the biggest nerfs is the nerf to the Halfling Safecracker uh, for crime decks. So he got a power buff from 3 to 4 actually, so that is a buff, but he lost Intimidate. So he won't be boosting himself by every crime you play anymore, but the deployability is still the same. So still a powerful card to start with. So for example, if you have 5 crimes in your hand, you will go to 9 points, but that is where he will stay at. He will no longer boost himself higher. So this will probably make a difference of a few points um, for both of these cards um, in your crime deck. So keep that in mind, especially for the, that first round. It's going to hurt quite a bit. Then this card right next to it also got a nice buff though. Uh, the Keeper of the Flame, still 4 power for 5 provisions and on deploy boosts his adjacent units by 1. But right now his tribute ability... It's still the same, so tribute 4 boosts all units in this row by 1 instead, but you decrease this card's tribute by 1 for every allied cleric. If you manage to get 4 clerics on the board, and I think this might include this one, um, you actually can do this for free, so basically giving you up to 12 points. Um, although it's going to count him as well, so up to 13 points, so boost all units in this row by 1, so that's going to be all units. So that's up to 9 with the 4 power that he has already is 13 points. It's uh, conditional of course, you need to have the coins or you need to have the clerics. But what's more important, this gives you a card in the Fire Sworn uh, Swarm archetype that allows you to finish the match with this. Because if you've played Fire Swarm before, uh, you know that the problem with that is that you... Fill your board rather quickly and there's no real good cards to finish it off with. Um, there are of course a few cards that just boost everything. But this card allows you to just for one free space boost another row again for a very low provision cost. So definitely a card to keep an eye on if you're looking to uh, work with a uh, Fire Sworn deck. And then two other cards that got a change that I'm really really confused about is... Uh, the Borsodi brothers. So right now their fee ability has changed to, well, Horse Borsodi gives an allied unit vitality by one. 
and Evil Posodi gives an enemy unit bleeding by one. Which is, I mean, it's boring. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's another card that gives bleeding or vitality, but I think it's, it's just useless. It's one for one, so I don't know. I feel like this could have been better, um, even though, of course, it is an extra fee ability, so it does allow you to spend those coins, but it's a weird change, uh, especially if you remember where these guys, guys were coming from, because originally they had a two boost and a two damage uh, ability, but that has been completely neutered now. Those cards are barely played anymore, you don't see them um, anywhere these days, so that's that's a bit, a bit of a sad change, but that is uh, basically it for Syndicate, and that means that we've uh, reviewed all um, factions. I mean, it's a good mixed bag of changes some good nerfs some good buffs and then some questionable choices but still overall i think this patch is very positive towards the balance of the game i don't think it will upset the balance too much there's no real game changes maybe aside from commandos that will be uh, researching really really nicely now which is good because i already have a deck guide on the, for it on the the channel here so check that out if you uh if you want to see how that deck actually works but then of course there's a second part to this patch the journey Triss's journey because uh right now yeah i i've played a few matches already so uh, i'm at level three right now but we have a very very cool new journey ahead of us so Triss. Uh, is being her story story is being told by Conduira Stilly, which is of course who is of course the Anaromancer that we all know and love. So uh, we are going to go through all the cosmetics, just giving our opinion on what uh, these cosmetics are, and then giving you a general overview if the cost of the season pass is well, the premium pass is worth it. But let's let's unlock this first. So again, this is the cost if you're playing on, uh, well, basically on mobile and the Mac version. Uh, you can definitely buy this on GOG as well. And on GOG, I think it's just uh, one euro uh, cheaper. I think it's 9.99 on GOG for the normal premium pass. Again, getting 25 levels to me is not worth the extra 17 euro. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you want to support the game, you can. But again, this is where the value is. So I'm going to go for this. And there we go. Did I? Wait a second. I got three extra levels out of that. That was weird. But let's go through this. Of course, the lady skin of Triss giving you her basic Witcher 3 outfit here, um, which is, of course, the uh, yeah kind, kind of cleavage outfit, but still one of the very nice outfits that she has in the Witcher 3. I'm guessing her ball gown is going to be in here as well. But uh, we'll see about that in a minute. The default coin that you get is also really cool. I've seen this uh, in a few matches already. And it's the fireball coin. And it's very, very shiny. It's something that doesn't really look like a coin anymore. Which uh, I'm all for. It's just the circular design is still there. But I wouldn't call this a coin anymore. It looks like it's really, really laid on top there with the gem inside. Very, very cool indeed. You have a few avatars. So Teenage Triss. Uh, and then Triss on the fire, um, definitely, uh, definitely cool avatars as well, if you can combine that with a very cool border, um, such as this one, the ball dress border, so there we have the ball dress already, which is gonna come in, uh, in play rather soon, I suppose. This is also cool, so the violet butterflies, butterflies of course are tied to Triss, in that she has, well, at some point she used the spell to block arrows, and they turned into butterflies when they passed through the shield. So that's why uh, butterflies are usually linked to Triss in that way. And then of course we have another butterflies animated border and that's probably the two, those are probably gonna be the two that are recolors every few levels. She also got, ah, th those are scrolls, okay. I thought from the image here that might have been a, an arrow quiver, but scrolls on her back. Fair enough, it's on her back this time. That's something we haven't seen too much of. Then we have the Temerian Hood, of course, because she is the advisor to King Foltest at some point. She, of course, has the Northern Realms Regalia, or the Temerian symbol right on her hood there. And also, she also gets a very cute uh, backpack there. Oh, she has... Is that... Is that a, a jade figurine of Geralt? That is actually pretty, pretty nice as a detail. Ah, that's, that's cute. And then we got the, basically the Phoenix uh, border. That is actually really cool. If you combine that with a few other cards like the Dragon or basically the Phoenix uh, avatar, that is really cool. Of course, the title hints at that as well. 
And then we got the card backs. The card backs are always very impressive. And that is, I'm assuming, oh, it's Marigold's Hailstorm. So this is referring to basically the end of Yennefer's storyline um, where there was a uh, pogrom in Rivia where basically all the humans started to kill the non-humans uh, in a sort of blood fueled rage where they started to kill dwarves, elves uh, and gnomes. Men, women, children, they didn't care and basically Yennefer and Triss tried to stop the mob but Yennefer basically died at that point, same as Geralt. Um, and that's where their story basically ended. Even though the games, of course, continued that, in the books that is where their story ended. Um, and the pogrom was actually resolved because of an accidental spell by Triss, because Triss got hit in the face by a rock, I think it was. She lost a few of her teeth, so she couldn't pronounce the spell anymore. And she just fumbled out some words, and instead of the spell that she wanted to produce, she generated a huge massive hailstorm, which pelted on top of all the people and just calmed them down in one go and they started to realize what they had done because uh, the streets of Rivia were uh, filled with blood that day. Skipping ahead a little bit we get the Temerian battle code of course still continuing the Temerian team uh, and we get what is this oh that's actually really cool it's a very cool artistic depiction of that I don't know why it's black here it looks like it's black and not blue uh, and she her eyes look a bit crooked but other than that cool art style I suppose. And then we get a more classic coin with the gem in the middle and of course again the butterflies and our first aura, the blue butterflies aura. So butterflies basically, Triss is gonna be butterflies. Oh, aviation goggles, I mean they're calling them medical goggles but this is, that's actually a really cool uh, avatar as well. Aviation goggles, I mean they're calling them medical goggles but I don't, I don't, I don't think those are medical goggles. They, they look pretty, pretty cool, they make her uh, look a bit more younger than uh, than she actually is because of course most sorceresses are pretty old um, but it, it gives her the the youthful look especially in the avatar she looks really really sprunky uh, more backpacks the scarlet backpack ah oh, yeah okay it's red so it's basically a recolor of the other one that's a bit lazy usually there aren't that many recolors in the season pass uh, the premium pass itself so that's a bit sad oh but this is gorgeous Full test advisor card back. I do like the art style. That is really nice. Um, and we got Philip. Did we get Philippa already animated in the season pass before? I'm not sure. It's. I feel like we have. Then we got the medical robe. Basically, it's very funny. That looks like Shani's outfit. But of course, in The Witcher One, Shani and Triss are like romantic adversary so that's a, a bit weird shorter hair hairstyle same as uh Yennefer basically got and then we get ah the medic's backpack okay so this the, the potions and everything an alchemist aura for some reason it's bright purple that is cool ah and a chibi a chibi tris that is also really really cute really cute with the same outfit as well aha now we get the rose of remembrance we're going into the rose imagery here um, seems like it's pretty calm. We get more roses over here, and then of course the uh, yeah the pool from The Witcher 2, uh, where we actually get the rose of remembrance from, or we we leave it there. I kind of forgot about that. Um, then we get the Brokilon card back. So basically, what we see here is a wounded Geralt being brought to uh, Brokilon by Triss after the battle at Tanit, if I'm not mistaken, where Viljafords basically crippled Geralt severely and he needed to go to Brokilon to get healed by the Dryads there. Aha, there we get a bit more fancy artifacts on the back of her uh, outfit here. The Fire Staff, because of course Triss is mainly a pyromancer, we've seen that a lot in the games. Uh, we also get Triss's medallion, the Wolf Mask, because by I mean, every single woman in this game needs to have something that ties her to Geralt. Uh, but there we go, the Emerald Fos Fox Mask. I mean, she, we say fox, but that's that's just the wolf again, isn't it? It's a slightly different design, but that, not, not that much of a difference. And then we get, ooh, the Urn of Shadows. So that's basically the uh, Deathwish um, stratagem that we talked about uh, just a while ago. And we get her Witcher 2 outfit, so the Assassins of Kings outfit. A fire tornado, obviously, we get King Foltest's uh, crown on top of the Temerian lilies, which is also nice. Is that? 
mean, you say Scarlet Battle Coat, but I feel like this is basically an Eternal Fire outfit, <laughs> which fits her, her bright red hair, but it's a bit weird with the connotation of what the uh, Eternal Fire stands for, but that's their color scheme, the white and the red, that's uh, a bit weird. And then, Great Balls of Fire! All right, very nice music reference there. Oh, I love this style. That's the second card back we get in that style, and that is absolutely stunning. And of course, I'm guessing the final outfit is going to be the uh, the ball dress. Um, we can go, so yeah, that's the pink reskins. And then, yeah, we got the flower in her hair. And then, of course, ooh, glamorous dress or, you know, you know, um, ro romance dress. There we go. There she is. Marigold the Fearless. Yeah, you must be fearless if you want to battle in that dress. That is... <laughs> I used that outfit in my Witcher 3 uh, playthrough and I sometimes felt that it was extremely not practical <laughs> if you wanted to fight in this thing, but still very cool. And we get a, like a comic style noir Triss avatar at the very end. But yeah, this outfit is what we're going to go for, of course, uh, at the very end of the season pass. One more thing we need to do, we're gonna take a look at the contracts. Ah, no, I got three levels because my uh, premium challenges were completed. That was why, it's not a bug. We got the, uh, yeah, we got 60 crown pieces because of that, and that just gained us, gave us uh, six extra levels. I actually got, what's this? Ah, because I completed five uh, journey quests, we got 10 more reward points. That's absolutely fine, I have plenty of those now. <laughs> Can we please stop? So, contracts wise, let's go to journey and scroll all the way to the bottom past the ones that I haven't completed yet. Close your eyes, please. Um, then we get uh, over here, if you complete 20 journey quests, you get an extra title. You get yellow butterflies if you've completed every single quest in the journey. Uh, reaching level 100 uh, gives you this magical aura, so basically purple, purple, pink kind of magic stuff. That's cool. Uh, then of course the avatars when you reach level 100 in the standard and extended journey, which is uh, basically pretty standard. Then we get the ingredients bag after 20 games with the medical robe. And after 40 we get the alchemist robe. That actually looks like... Ah, uh, that might be a reskin of the medical robe, but it looks... Again, more Novigradian, some, some, that, that color scheme really looks like Eternal Fire again, but just a black version. Then the Assassins of Kings, which gives you Big Sister, um, linking her to uh, Siri, of course. The Megascope Backpack, another recolor, recolor of the backpack. And the Traveler Outfit, a reskin of the uh, Witcher 2 outfit, so fair enough. Then, this should be the more interesting one. So the herb sack for the... Oh no, it's a Damarian battle coat. So another uh, reskin of the... Although it looks like a pouch this time. It's not just a simple backpack anymore. And a healing aura. So that is also a unique one, I think. That doesn't look like a reskin. It looks like it has bubbles. Which fits very nicely, because Triss is pretty bubbly. Then the fearless outfits. Haha. -ha. Do we get... Ooh, that's a really cool hood. So that fits with the battle dress, uh, or the ball dress. Then that's actually a fox mask. So the colors actually make sense now. And then the silk dress. Oh, that's... Is that just a reskin? It looks slightly different. It looks like it, it covers up more of her arms. Although it just looks... It, I hate that I can't make this bigger. <laughs> that's really annoying that you can't enlarge that. Because it looks like it's slightly different. Although it probably is just a reskin. I think that's basically it. The rest are just... Ah, the alchemist avatar. That is awesome. So she put down the goggles and then something exploded. So that almost gives you like a link to um, Ulzer, which is which is very, very nice. Okay, and that's basically it for everything that the journey has to offer. I think it's worth it again, just because of the, the plenty of outfits that you're going to get for uh, Triss, uh, especially if you're Team Triss. This is definitely going to be a journey for you. And just for, for 10 bucks, I think it's it's definitely worth all the cosmetics that you're getting. But that's it for this video. So uh, what do you guys think about patch 8.5, the changes there, and of course the journey for Triss. Let me know in the comment section down below because I'm really curious about your opinion. And we can talk about it further down there. Uh, and with that said, thank you guys enormously and gals of course, enormously for watching. And I hope to see you in the next episode of Gwentage. Goodbye and stay nutty.